the Detroit Pistons have lost 27 straight games. They've broken the all-time record for most consecutive losses in a single season, and this team is horrid. And I think specifically the job that Monty Williams has done has been putrid. Now, I'm not going to sit in here and yell at you like some other YouTuber uh, who doesn't really know what he's talking about. Instead, I'm going to sit here and actually break down film and talk about how the Pistons have some really bad fatal flaws in terms of the way that not only their roster is constructed, which is Troy Weaver's job, but also what Monty Williams is doing with the team. Because even a year ago, this team was not that bad, and now they have Kate Cunningham back. The guys are all a year older. They have a little bit more experience under their belt. I think some of their struggles stem from Dwayne Casey, the kind of poor decisions he made as a coach, and kind of the lack of development we've seen in Detroit, not only in the last coaching regime, but even beyond that. So I think that it's really important that we break down everything in this video, four specific things that I would change if I was in Monty Williams' shoes on day one. If I got into Detroit as a head coach right now, there are four specific things that would instantly change and I would never look back because I think that there are huge flaws with the way the Detroit Pistons are playing right now that have really contributed to their 27 game losing streak. I don't wanna to waste too much more time. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more, and let's get into it now. The first change I would make revolves around the way that the Pistons play help defense, or should I say don't play help defense. Now, I think that there's a lot of confusion right now about what's going wrong defensively for the Pistons, and yes, I did reference another YouTuber who's kind of on the come up that I think is a little ridiculous sitting there yelling into his microphone about how stupid and dumb Monty Williams and Steven Silas are, but he's not even addressing the main issue in Detroit, which is pretty funny to me. And the main issue stems from something that Monty Williams used to do in Phoenix, which is basically play very little help defense. Monty Williams is not a big believer in it. So when we look at this play specifically here in their most recent game against the Brooklyn Nets, the one that made them lose their 27th consecutive game, we see Cade Cunningham here picking up Mikhail Bridges in transition. And I think the best way to look at some of the flaws and, and ways that the Pistons could quickly improve without making some type of big trade is making some actual scheme principle adjustments. And this is the one that really stands out to me. This is the most important one of the entire video, and that's why I'm putting it first. I don't wanna waste your guys' time. I wanna jump right into the nitty gritty, and let's watch this play play out here. We see now Mikhail Bridges gets downhill, and we've got pretty decent shell coverage here. Alec Burks is covering the guy that is not on the screen. We've got Duran kind of following in as the trail man. Bogdanovich is in a pretty good spot. Stewart is tagging his. But this is where things would be a little bit different under a different coaching staff. You'd maybe have Stewart taking an, a little bit of a, a bigger step over toward Mikhail Bridges because right now essentially the Nets have Cunningham isolated one-on-one -on -one with arguably their best player having the ball in his hands. And then from this, the Nets are just looking for one-on-one -on -one play. And with how Monty Williams coaches, he's fine with living with that. But I'm going to break down why this isn't good. Even here at this spot of the floor now, he's worked his way into the middle. I would say Kate Cunningham's done a very good job containing this. He's taken multiple seconds off the shot clock, dribbling the basketball, and typically anytime a guy's dribbling the ball for a really long time, means you're doing a pretty good job containing the player with your just normal ball contained on perimeter defense. And I think just given the fact that this was early transition, um, Bridges was coming downhill with a full head of steam, I would say Cade's done a, a very nice job here and he's still in a really good position. Although the issue is Bridges is relatively close to the hoop because the Pistons don't deter anyone from coming down to the rim despite playing two big men, Isaiah Stewart and Jalen Duran. And at this spot here, Mikhail Bridges, with as much talent as he has, this is still a makeable shot, even though this is pretty good coverage. I would say Cade Cunningham is getting a, a solid contest on this at least. The issue is the team isn't deterring anyone from getting into the paint because even in one-on-one -on -one play, they feel comfortable because that's how good NBA players are. And it's not just the Nets. Like, Mikhail Bridges is not a 1A option. He's not even a 1B option, probably, on a championship caliber team. So when you think about, okay, how would they guard the Milwaukee Bucks? How would they guard the Dallas Mavericks? How would they guard some of these teams with really premier top-end talent? Well, the answer is they're going to play him one-on-one, -on -one, and that just doesn't work in the NBA. And a talented player like Mikhail Bridges is going to finish that play, and I want to see it play out again in full time. Again, good cutoff by Cade Cunningham, does a nice job limiting Mikhail Bridges, but there's no help side defense at all. There's no tag, there's no 
you know, added crash in. And because of that, everyone's comfortable attacking the way that they know how. And I want to go back to the 2022 Western Conference semifinals. This is game seven where the Phoenix Suns got absolutely obliterated by the Dallas Mavericks. And if we look at how that series played out, because Monty Williams allowed Mikhail Bridges to try and play Luka Doncic one-on-one -on -one for the entire series, and it ended up coming back to bite Monty Williams in the rear end because Luka Doncic is an all-world player. And remember, this is at a time where the Suns were really talented. They were the one seed in the Western Conference, and Mikhail Bridges was a first-team all-defense member. He was one of the best point-of-attack defenders in the NBA at this time in the year 2022. There was legitimate conversations about him being a Defensive Player of the Year candidate because of how much Monty Williams relied on him. If you compare that to the Detroit Pistons roster now, who's your elite all-world point-of-attack defender? The answer is they don't really have one. Kate Cunningham, I think, has the size to be a solid defender. Jaden Ivey just has not gotten better defensively. We'll talk about that a little bit later on and some of the coaching we need to see still happen in his development. Osar Thompson, I think, has a chance to be an elite defender, an elite point of attack defender. He has all the tools. I think he's smart. I think he's got the length, size, athleticism, but he's a rookie. So are you relying on him to stop guys? Is he going to be a defensive stopper? on night one of his NBA career? The answer is clearly no. And when you look at Detroit, I mean, the same thing that bit Monty Williams in the rear end in the Western Conference semifinals is exactly what's hurting them this season. Look at where Luka is. This is a low post up. I mean, really, there's not gonna be any help. We got a small dig from campaign, but I mean, look at this. We've got everyone has one foot in the paint where they're playing, oh, I'm in help side, but they're not actually gonna ever help. Like, there's no willingness here. And you might say, oh, it's a 40-point game, that's why. I'm telling you, this is how it was all series long. We'll look at more clips later. But again, just watch. This is how Monty Williams coaches. And this is one of the flaws I could have told you coming into the year the Detroit Pistons were going to have if he followed that schematic, which is exactly what he's doing. Flash forward back to now, and we're going to look at their recent game against the Utah Jazz. This is when uh, kind of the toilet bowl was going down. The Jazz were super short-handed in this game, and people thought maybe, just maybe, this is the game for the Pistons to win. It was a pretty competitive game, but let's look at a clip that I think is very similar to that Western Conference semifinals clip I just showed you with Luka Doncic posting up. This time we get Kelly Olynyk matched up one-on-one -on -one with Cade Cunningham. McDonavich has no interest in digging. Jay ivey has got his eyes on the basketball, but he's not in a spot to dig. Marvin Bagley's in no spot to really provide help. And Isaiah Stewart, even just guarding John Collins over in the corner, who, yes, Collins is a fairly decent shooter. I think you would rather live with Collins shooting a perimeter shot, and maybe you can get rotations and scramble, rather than just letting a six foot eleven Kelly Olynyk attack your point guard one-on-one -on -one in the paint. They leave him completely on an island by himself. Kelly Olynyk makes a really nice post move, and it's an easy bucket. Again, this is the type of issue that the Pistons are having, it doesn't have anything to do with really their point of attack, although less, I'll completely agree that their point of attack defense isn't good. And a big reason why is they have players who don't have a lot of point of attack defensive balance. They have some technical flaws, which we again are gonna talk about a little bit later on in this video. But when we actually look at the scheme, the, the principles of their shell defense, which is exactly what this is. It's basically a four out offense beating a low post. This is like standard high school day one of practice shell drill activity. And pretty much every team I've ever been around or in close proximity to is going to bring some form of real help, meaningful help in these situations. And Monty Williams is just not going to do that. And it leaves Kate Cunningham looking silly under the basket as Kelly Olynyk makes a really nice move, and Kelly Olenek kind of lit up Detroit in this game. Let's go back to that Phoenix series. Another post up here for Luka Doncic, and again, I think it looks pretty similar here, leaving Cam Johnson one-on-one -on -one with him, and offensive talent beats good defense with how talented of a player Luka Doncic is. The fact that the Suns really didn't have an answer for him uh, really comes down to the fact that they just never blitzed him, they didn't double him, they didn't really help on him. Like, the best we're getting is this Biombo dig, which to be honest, isn't even that good anyway. And he's kind of leaving Davis Bertans open. They're not even committing to a double, but it's kind of a bad dig because I don't think Biombo has the foot speed to get back on Bertans in this clip. 
and Luka's just too good. And I mean, we're seeing other players take advantage of a worse defensive team uh, in Detroit. So I think that's a really important thing to note. Let's go back to the Pistons, another clip here against the Jazz. And this is a good example of the fact that this team doesn't have good point of attack perimeter defenders and something Jaden Ivey Ivey specifically needs to be better at. This is pick and roll coverage here. You can clearly tell Marvin Bagley and Jaden Ivey are not on the same wavelength here. Marvin Bagley is telling Jaden Ivey to essentially switch this even though there's really not a reason to. So it's a little bit of a defensive miscommunication. It happens. Now I will say it happens more with the Pistons than any other team in the league right now. Part of that is because they're young. Part of that is because they don't have a lot of good defenders in general. Not a lot of defensive feel. But I think the issue here specifically kind of lies in what happens afterward. Jaden Ivey here, he's up in the air. He's kind of not really in a spot to effectively guard Olenek because he wasn't really expecting to. He tries taking away the passing lane and then he figures he'll recover to Sexton. So he starts to do that and then he realizes, oh, I have to switch here. And he's out of position already. He's giving the middle to Kelly Olenek, which to be honest with you, isn't that bad in a normal defensive scheme. In a normal defensive scheme, you're gonna have Kate Cunningham plugging the gap. You'll have Isaiah Stewart and Boyan Bogdanovich in help side. But remember, the Pistons don't bring help like a normal NBA team, like most NBA teams do. So because of that, it's really Ivy on an island with Kelly Olynyk, and Ivy needs some help in terms of actual tactical, technical coaching because this was his biggest flaw coming out of Purdue, and this was the one real concern I had about Jaden Ivy coming out of his draft. A lot of people looked at shooting, whatever you have, what position is he? My big concern is what position does he guard and why is it not point guard? And the real reason was because he just never is balanced. If you look at his footing here, he's completely crouched forward, he's not down in the stance, and that's a problem, and he gambles for steals a lot, which I love Jaden Ivey as a player, I really do, I think Jaden Ivey is going to be a fantastic player in this league at some point, we're going to talk about him on the offensive end later in this video as well, but Kelly Olenek just takes advantage of him here, Ivey's flat footed, gets beat to the cup, and again, like I said, in a normal defense, there's going to be gap help from K. there's going to be weak side help from Boyan and from Isaiah Stewart, They clearly have no interest in doing that because that's how they're coached. They're told, we're not going to help off this because Monty thinks it's better to not have to rotate and scramble. The whole point of rotating and scrambling is to help out the guy who got beat. And my one question, if I got to ask Monty Williams something right now about his defense, it would be, what guy scores the basketball? Is it the guy with the ball or the guy without the ball? And the answer is always the guy with it. Even if Olenek makes a pass here, let's say Bogdanovich did help in and they kick it over to Fontecchio in the corner, then Fontecchio becomes the guy who's dangerous because he's the one who has the basketball. You have to have the ball to score. It's a pretty simple concept. And if you're coached right, we could have Bogdanovich tag in, could have Isaiah Stewart push over to the corner, Kate Cunningham rotates up, and Ivy rotates back out to the top. It's a pretty simple scramble, honestly. And that's one of the things about NBA spacing against five out. The scrambles become pretty easy because guys are in pretty defined spots. You know where they're gonna stand a lot of the time. So because of that, your scrambles can sometimes even be easier than like some college levels where players are just kind of all over the place randomly sometimes. Like this is a pretty easy help and rotate um, after the initial miscommunication, which unfortunately the Pistons just don't do. And again, you have a six foot 11 center attacking your guard. He gets an and one. I mean, it's pretty obvious what's going to happen in clips like this. Going on to our next example here, there's a couple of issues with this. Again, it really comes down to a Linux just being bigger than the guy that is matched up on him. But this will happen. This is transition. A Linux does a nice job running the floor. He gets downhill and mismatched with Alec Burks. That is A-OK. That happens. I think my one issue that I'm going to say here, though, is what really is going on in terms of the communication on this team. Why is Burks not yelling at James Wiseman? Hey, I need help. Let's try and switch this if we can. Let's get you matched up onto the big man down low. Yes, I understand Walker Kessler is walking up over half court, but Walker Kessler on the three-point line is a much lesser risk than Kelly Olenek posting up in early transition. None of that happens. The communication is not very good between the players. Again, part of that is because they're young. Part of that is because there's not a lot of good defensive players on the team. So the coaching has to change. The scheme has to change doesn't hear and James Wiseman is completely oblivious to what's going on and once he's here in this spot I think one of the things about James Wiseman that if you if you would argue that this guy actually deserves to be on an NBA floor which I think is pretty questionable right now um, 
I think the one thing you could argue is, hey, he's super tall and he's lengthy and he can be a shot blocker. But if you're not gonna bring any help, even in a situation like this, like let's go back just a little bit here and let's rewatch this initial setup. Like if you're not at this spot here, like you see a Linux momentum starting to bring him to, toward the hoop. Like if you're a big man guarding Walker Kessler on the three point line, your instinct should tell you, I gotta go help. Like that's just pretty basic basketball. But Wiseman doesn't really have that feel. He's late to help. And part of that is again, the scheme tells him not to. And Kelly Olenek is putting on a master class here early on in Detroit because they just don't bring help. They leave their guards in spots where they're left out to dry. And really, if you're going to win with this system, if you're going to win with this scheme specifically, you have to be really not only disciplined, but you have to have just good perimeter defenders. That's part of why Marcus Sasser has found so much success in his rookie year in limited minutes and in kind of a funky situation because he's a good perimeter defender. He has perimeter defensive intangibles and talent that makes him playable in this system. Whereas the other guys just quite frankly don't. Jaden Ivey doesn't have that. Kay Cunningham, I wouldn't say is going to be an elite point of attack defender. I think Elsar Thompson could again blossom into that, but you're really kind of Losing the point of playing two big men where you have added rim protection, you have added size, strength around the rim to deter shots close to the basket. The Pistons right now are just getting walked over because their point of attack defense isn't good enough. They don't have enough length and just overall defensive talent. I mean, do I have to talk about Boyan Bogdanovic? The, the team just isn't built to play Monty Williams' system. And I don't think Monty Williams' system is good in the year 2023 anyway. The second flaw I would pay a ton of attention to and change immediately if I was the head coach of the Detroit Pistons is really the lineup choices for Monty Williams. And I think it's been all over the place this year in a few different ways. First of all, there's lineups where one of Cade Cunningham or Jaden Ivey are not on the floor at all. So you go through stretches of time where you don't have arguably your two best shot creators on the floor at this point. I, I think that's again, a pretty questionable decision. And just overall, the way that the team is built, there's not a lot of shooting. There really isn't. So how do you go about maximizing some of your non-shooters or how do you go about maximizing, you know, your perimeter talent like Cade Cunningham, like Jaden Ivey? How do you maximize an Elsar Thompson? And to me, even though I think Isaiah Stewart can play power forward in the NBA in stretches of time, I think that they should look at switching a couple of things up in terms of who's the long-term starting center, who's the long-term backup center, who's the starting uh, power forward. And to me, I would play a little bit smaller and I would try and kind of lean into their quickness a little bit more than they currently do with Stewart at power forward, Duran at center. And I think, listen, Duran and Stewart can play together. I do believe that, but I want to talk about some things that I think would really elevate this team if we saw them kind of splitting minutes. And I think just overall making their team a little bit deeper because of that. So the very first thing I want to focus on here is this clip of Isaiah Stewart hitting a three-pointer. And this is a really nice read from Kate Cunningham. Um, we're going to talk about him and his offensive talent to kind of conclude this video as we end on a positive note, hopefully. But this is just good basketball. Kate Cunningham I quickly identifies that uh, help side is in a spot, a strong side, where they're not going to be able to get a good closeout to Isaiah Stewart. He's got a pretty quick release, honestly, and is able to get it to go. And he's been a good three-point shooter for quite some time now in the NBA. But that's not really my concern about Isaiah Stewart at power forward. I think my bigger concern of, okay, if he's at power forward, it's more about his matchups. You're asking Isaiah Stewart to cover out in space, which I don't think he does a terrible job of. But I think that realistically, it's more of a challenge than playing him at center would be. And yes, I know the Pistons, you're worried about rebounding. That is an important thing. But I think with Osar Thompson on the floor a little bit more frequently with um, Jaden Ivey and Kate Cunningham, you do have some positional size that maybe you can gang rebound as a team as long as your center is focused on boxing out. Isaiah Stewart's a very strong man. I think you could get away with it if you're well coached. And I do want to just say that, let's say hypothetically that Duran's not on the floor in this situation. Let's say that Isaiah Stewart is the sole center and we've got some other player on the floor instead of Duran. Let's say maybe Boyan Bogdanovich. You might be able to go into more freelance five out spacing in these situations where Isaiah Stewart would then have Nick Claxton on him. And instead of Nick Claxton getting to play center field and be kind of a help size shot blocker, 
He's asked to cover Stewart out on the perimeter, and with Stewart playing the four, not only does it come down to the spacing and, and shooting, it comes down to decision making off the dribble and, and ball movement and ability to attack closeouts. And I think if you went a little bit smaller in your starting lineup, you could probably find a little bit more success in matching up with other teams early on, because honestly, the team needs a shakeup. And even though Stewart, I wouldn't say is to blame, and I would still play him a good amount of minutes. I think that Stewart's an integral part of the team. I think that they would maybe be better suited with him playing more center than power forward because of his ability to stretch the floor and probably pull out rim protectors at a greater rate than obviously Jalen Duren does. And I think you just kind of mitigate what Isaiah Stewart really could be um, by playing him at power forward more frequently than not, which... Again, I don't think it's a huge issue, but I think it's something that I would make a change. And part of the reason I would make that change is because I would really love to stagger the guards here quite a bit. And what I mean by that is I really, really love some of the pairings that I think Detroit has. And when you look at, hey, who are the top five, six players on the team, your mind instantly goes to Kay Cunningham, Jay Nivey, Jalen Duran. Again, this is in no order. Isaiah Stewart, Boyan Bogdanovich, and Alsar Thompson. Those are the six best players on the team. I feel very comfortable in that. I'm sure that everyone else does as well that's watching this. Maybe you have a slight disagreement. And if we're talking long-term, then who knows how much Boyan factors into the long-term future of the team. But I think that you have two really interesting duos that can work really, really well together. The first one I want to highlight is Kay Cunningham with Jalen Durin. I think that th these two guys could be really perfect complementary fits, kind of like what we've seen from Luka Doncic and Derek Lively this year in Dallas. Durin's not quite as big in terms of his height as Lively, but he's, uh, I think, a more polished player. I think he's got a little bit more skill in his game, and I think that he's somebody who, with how Cade plays, really complements him with his ability to put on backside rim pressure, catch lobs, also work out of the short roll a bit. And I think with Kate Cunningham's patience, we can see some real success. Now, the one thing I want to point out here, this is the Detroit Pistons best set, in my opinion. This is Spain action. And Spain action is essentially a screen the screener. Duran's going to set a screen here on Mikhail Bridges to try and free up Kate Cunningham. And then Ivy is going to look to pin whoever ends up guarding Duran afterward. So as we watch this play play out, you see Ivy goes and sets a back screen here on Claxton, which frees up the backside of the rim in which Jalen Duran is going to roll into. You see Cam Thomas is clearly worried about Ivy popping out of this. So Thomas has his hand on Ivy's hip and Kay Cunningham has just enough of an advantage here against Bridges by using that Duran screen to fit up a very nice lob, perfectly placed and Duran gets the easy two to go. And this is kind of what I'm talking about with Duran's ability to roll and roll quickly. Look at how quickly he gets downhill here. He's actually already further downhill than Kay Cunningham. And when you pair that with Cunningham's patience, his passing ability, I think he's obviously the best passer on the team. I think he's the most reliable passer on the Detroit Pistons is one of the things I loved about him coming out of Oklahoma State. I think if you pair that consistently with Duran with as much spacing on the floor as possible, that's where you find a ton of success. And I'm not saying you can't play Stewart and Duran together. Stewart's on the floor in this clip, but I think when we get into that second duo, you'll see exactly why I wanna play Stewart at center a little bit more frequently. And the real idea here for me is Kate Cunningham and Duran can play a real good majority of the game together. And then your other duo, which we'll get into in a second, is on the floor at all times when Kate Cunningham and Duran are not on the floor. And I think that would, again, really bolster some of your chances. Uh, at winning a game, which they just haven't done so far this season. So when we look at some of the data here on Kate Cunningham and Jalen Duran together, Kate Cunningham and Duran have played in 15 games together, about 26 minutes per game when they do play together, and they're only minus 2.7 plus minus per game. And now listen, it doesn't sound great to be a negative plus minus when you would say probably your two best players, Cunningham and Duran, are on the floor together. You'd hope to win those minutes. The reality is they haven't so far, but what I do believe, what I firmly do believe, is that with these two guys on the floor, it's going to keep you in games, especially when you look at how badly this team is losing and how, just how poor of a team they are overall. I mean, Cunningham and Duran is one of your first keys to maybe winning a game and being a really good competitive team for a while. And then when you look at this trio of Kate Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, and Jalen Duran, they've appeared in 12 games together. Not very many minutes per game, just about 12.4 minutes per game, but they're actually positive. They have a positive plus minus, positive 0.7. It's a really small 
plus minus. It really is. But again, we're talking about a team that's lost 27 straight games. We're talking about a really bad team, a historically bad team in terms of getting wins and outscoring their opponent. Anything that is slightly positive, you need to lean fully into. And I think this Kate Cunningham, Ivy Duran trio is a great example of that. And I would say that those are their three best players that I would trust going forward long term. Now, I know people are going to say Ivy's not that good. A lot of people have some beef with Ivy. I think Ivy's somebody who, in the right situation, given kind of a little bit more leeway and a little bit more kind of leniency with the way he plays, I think he could be really, really darn good. I really do. Um, and I think someone's just got to trust in him. When we look at the second clip, I slowed this one down here because I think this is a beautiful clip in general between Duran and Kate Cunningham. So I want this one to really tell the story of what these two could be kind of doing on a regular basis. We see off of this, Kate Cunningham is hitting Jalen Duran off of this action and they instantly trigger into a DHO. And if anyone remembers my pre-draft analysis on Jalen Duran, my potential comp for him, the guy that I thought maybe he could blossom into and turn into was a Bam at a biotype player because I think he has good perimeter playmaking feel. I think he's comfortable with the ball in his hands. And this is something Bam at a bio does all the time for the Miami Heat. He triggers dribble handoffs. He elevates the perimeter players on the team by freeing them into space. And that's exactly what we see here in this clip. Kay Cunningham gets his hips by his defender. He's attacking down the middle of the floor. And with this, he puts a lot of rim pressure on. You see everyone trying to get in, make some plays on the basketball. Kate Cunningham strong with it here, though. But his floor vision is really what separates him um, from other Pistons on the team because he makes a beautiful drop-off pass here to Jalen Duran, who capitalizes on the dunk. I just think this is good basketball. These two-man actions are things that will keep Detroit in games if they are playing their best. If you can have Duran and Kate Cunningham operating off of each other a lot, I think you're going to find more success uh, than they currently are at this point in time. Now, when we look at Ivy and Isaiah Stewart, this is a different kind of pairing that I think complements each other very well when you think about their actual skill sets and the way that they're going to be able to complement each other because Jaden Ivey is the fastest, quickest player with the ball in his hands on the Detroit Pistons. And I've coached players like this, not at the NBA level, but lower levels. And anytime you have a quick ball handler, the real thing you want to do is pair him with shooting and you want to open up space for them and tell them, be aggressive, get downhill, get as many paint touches as you possibly can, because against normal teams, that's gonna force rotations, it's gonna force collapses, and you're gonna get kick out opportunities to good shooters. And this is why I think that having Isaiah Stewart playing center could be really darn good. In this example, we've got Nick Claxton matched up on Isaiah Stewart. And listen, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. The Pistons have played Isaiah Stewart at center this season, but my entire point is they need to do it more and they need to have Isaiah Stewart and Jalen Duran, one of the two on the floor at all times, and they need to have one of Kate Cunningham and Jaden Ivey on the floor at all times, because if you have those pairings, you have offensive pieces that can actually work together to score the basketball reliably. Here we have a pretty nice action. I, uh, Stewart comes up to set the screen for Ivey, and with Ivey's speed, look at how much pressure he puts on this pick and roll. He gets downhill extremely quickly, and Mikhail Bridges is now in chase, and obviously Claxton is playing in his typical drop, which makes this little pop action for Isaiah Stewart wide open. I mean, look at the absolute amount of space that he has out of this action, and Ivy turns it into a wide open jump shot because this is just simple, easy basketball, even for young guys like Jaden Ivy. This is like walk into the gym and you're able to execute stuff like this, and it just attacks teams in a really good way. Like, think about it, if you're facing the Milwaukee Bucks, Brooke Lopez is going to be playing a deep drop coverage. You can get this shot all game long. And with how good of, an, of a shooter Isaiah Stewart has developed to become, you should want this shot if you're the Detroit Pistons. Yes, you don't have a ton of spacing, but look at the amount of spacing you can create by having a pick and pop game between Ivy and Isaiah Stewart, which is what I really love. Let's get into the second clip here. It's actually the exact same play, but this time Ivy attacks a little bit differently and you still put the Nets in a pretty tough bind based on how they're trying to cover this with their drop coverage. So let's go ahead and look at it again here. Same exact play, Isaiah Stewart sets Ivy up to his left, and now at this point, Mikhail Bridges is worried about that. 
he starts to look over his shoulder. Isaiah uh, and Jay Nivey uses his blazing speed, gets downhill, and again just turns an easy pick and pop into a made three pointer. And this is just it's just good basketball. This is the type of look you want to generate. And overall, for me, the big change here is just lineups. You have to have one of Ivy on the floor or Cade Cunningham. One of those two guys have to be on the floor at all times for them to win a game. I really do believe that. And you have to have one of Duran or Stewart on the floor. And I really think the best way to be competent for 48 minutes is completely spelling them off of each other. If Cunningham and Duran are out of the game, it better be the Ivy and Stewart show. I wanna see those two guys run a bunch of pick and pops. I wanna see those two guys try and operate in space, make the game super easy for these young guys, open up looks. The, the Pistons don't run a lot of sets. That's another thing I would probably change is I'm a big believer in set plays. I think set plays can generate quick advantage in a very timed and choreographed way. And I think for the Pistons, like if you're not gonna do that, you have to at least do some of this more frequently than they are. When we analyze Jaden Ivey's plus minus with certain players on the roster, I think first of all with Isaiah Stewart, that duo that we've been talking about with a minus 0.7 plus minus only in 14 minutes per game kind of shows that there's something there with Stewart and Ivy, the two of them playing on the floor together. And it's something that they just have to lean into more. I think that those two guys need to share the floor more than 14 minutes a game. I think just really setting your lineups in a way that they're going to be able to share the floor together is essential. When you look at Jaden Ivy plus Jalen Duran, those two guys are actually a positive plus 0.4. So Again, Ivy, like people are going to try and frame Ivy as this terrible player. I, I really don't think he is. I just think if you give him the right bigs to work with and you put him in spots to actually handle the basketball and, and play point guard, he's going to find success. And when you look at kind of Ivy with Stewart and a shooter, in this case, Boyan Bogdanovich, they're actually a plus one plus minus in, again, very limited minutes, nine games, 13.4, like People are going to say, oh, it's such small volume. This, I mean, yes, that's kind of the point. I'm saying play Jay Nivey more than he is. And that's kind of the point I'm making about Monty Williams is he just needs to play his better players more often. It's pretty simple. It's kind of the opposite of Tom Thibodeau who wins a bunch of games because he rides his players into the ground. Monty Williams is kind of hesitant to play some of his better players. I think part of that is because he's maybe not the best talent evaluator. And yes, he's looking at certain things. And yes, Jaden Ivey has some flaws in terms of his ability to keep the ball in front of him defensively. But again, if Monty Williams changes his own scheme and brings some help defense, Jaden Ivey becomes just probably naturally a better defender because some of those gambles do lead to steal. Some of those gambles lead to blocks. And if you have good help defense around him, you can probably get away with it a little bit more frequently as well. So when it comes to the overall lineup, here's what I'm kind of suggesting. I'm basically suggesting no more Killian Hayes. We're going to get to that in a second. I know some Pistons fans are going to be quite upset about that. Ivy and Cade have to split the point guard duties, and Isaiah Stewart and Jalen Duran have to split the center duties. And I think with that, you're going to actually have a competent roster. I'm essentially saying no more Wiseman. I'm saying very little Marvin Bagley. I just don't love it. I want to see Boyan Bogdanovich playing the four. I would like to see Osar Thompson play the four. I would like to get as much perimeter talent and perimeter spacing on the floor as possible because overall, like the team's just not good enough without spacing the floor. And yes, their spacing has been a bit better. Guys have been a little bit more disciplined in, in being in the right spots at the right time. And because of that, we've seen Kate Cunningham take steps forward in the last five, 10 games. We've seen Jay Nivey start to get a little bit more comfortable um, in that stretch as well. But I still think that the fact of, the fact of the matter is teams are gonna say, we're not really worried about Osar Thompson shooting threes. So if you're gonna play him, you have to play him at a position where you can get away with it and that usually means having more perimeter spacing around him because his cutting his athleticism his defensive uh, acumen his rebounding is all important and those are all things the pistons need to continue using and looking into especially the fact that you just picked him fifth overall you need to play these guys and right now Jaden Ivey is playing about 25 minutes a game. I don't think his usage is correct. I look at him as a point guard. I think if you're going to fully utilize him to the fullest of his capabilities, you put the ball in his hands, you let him attack downhill because he's got blazing speed. He's a pretty good isolation player. Um, and in limited usage this year in isolation, in fact, it's only 19 isolation possessions at the time I'm recording this, he's averaging over 1.6 points per possession out of isolation, which means once every other game almost, or twice every three games, he is getting an isolation opportunity. Just one. 
So you're you're looking at just kind of I think misusage of some of your better ball handlers, some of your former top five picks. So I would like to see more of that. And I would like to see less of this guy right here, Killian Hayes. Now, this is going to be the most controversial part of the video. Um, I have never been a Killian Hayes believer. I don't think he's very good. Um, in fact, I gave on draft night when the Pistons drafted him, I gave that individual pick an F. I said that drafting him over Tyrese Halliburton was going to be a debilitating flaw for the franchise. Um, and I have been proved right by that. Now, things worked out. They, get, they got Kate Cunningham the year later. Regardless, drafting Killian Hayes was an awful decision. Flat out terrible decision. And... It's, it's hard because like when you watch Killian Hayes, you can tell he's smart. You can tell he understands basketball. And I respect that. I respect that a ton. But he's just not good enough to be a real NBA player. And especially with the way that he plays, like you almost feel like he has to have the ball in his hands, which is what the Detroit Pistons have le leaned into the last four years. The answer, though, is you don't win that way. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. The Pistons have yet to be good with Killian Hayes. He's really never been a hugely positive player for them, uh, and I just don't expect him to ever be, especially with some of the spacing issues present on the team. Let's look at this pick and roll example. This is the exact right read by Killian Hayes. Like, like this is the hard thing is my analysis on him. Like, he's making the right decisions in the clips I'm going to show you for the most part. There's one that he doesn't make the right decision um, that I'm going to point out. But this is the right decision. Again, Brooke Lopez in deep drop coverage like we talked about. This is a mid-range pull-up. This is a makeable shot for 99.9% .9 of NBA players who play point guard. The issue is the guy who's 0.1% is Killian Hayes. And he completely leaves this short and airballs it so bad that Andre Jackson Jr. didn't know where the ball was. And it hit him, stayed in balance, and they get a dunk. Now, I don't think this is the way Monty Williams drew it up. And I just, to be honest, I'm over the Killian Hayes experiment. You have to stop playing him. It doesn't work. You can't win that way. And it's just not, it's not good. It just isn't. And I think that with, again, my lineup adjustments, I'm saying no more Killian. Ivy and Caden only playing point guard. Maybe Sasser a little bit if you want to incorporate him into that. Which I think, you know, on nights that you don't have one of Ivy or Cade, you obviously have to. But... Killian Hayes just isn't the answer. When we look at another example here, this one's actually earlier in that same game. Killian Hayes, this is a right-handed drive, still hasn't really developed much of a right hand, and he's stepping into that exact same spot of the floor. This is the right decision. He's smart, he's getting to the right spot on the floor, this is open space. The issue is he's not good. <laughs> the issue is he's just not a good player. Like, it's, it's really painful because like, to be honest, I mean, the Bucks are just willingly putting Damian Lillard on him because they're like not even worried about him having to guard then. Like, I don't, I don't even know why Dame is going over screens. I, I don't even understand the point of that for Milwaukee other than the fact that that's just typically what they do in their deep drop and chase kind of scheme. But Hayes makes the right decision. He's just not good enough to pay it off. And I think that's too much of a common theme here with the Pistons and something I would look to change. Um, and I think Monty Williams has to just completely pull him out of the rotation if we're being honest. Another example here with Killian, and you would say, oh, this just looks like the same thing. He misses a mid-range jump shot, and it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse. No, this is the issue here. Wiseman actually does a pretty nice job slipping downhill. Pretty good timing on this. This is this. There's a couple of things that I want to point out in this clip. We got, again, drop and chase. Maxi's in chase. We've got Paul Reed down in drop. But Killian Hayes is such a non-threat going to his right hand that we literally have Paul Reed exactly attached to Wiseman because they are not at all concerned about Killian Hayes as a scorer. So that's, a fir that's the first flaw. Is you running the pick and roll, you're not even going to capitalize with a roll man as much because Killian Hayes is that much of a non-threat. But the second thing is we actually got a really good lift from Isaiah Livers in the top of your screen the corner he lifts up to the wing he is wide open because the help side defender the uh, corner defender ends up looking in and really needlessly chasing into the screen action he didn't need to with the way that the Sixers were able to cover everything um, Maxi obviously his speed helps a ton in chase as well but if you're Killian Hayes like a lot of time you do make the right decisions, but if you're an incapable scorer, you have to make the right decision literally all of the time. And like, you just can't miss this. You can't miss this kick out to Isaiah Livers if you want to play and your name is Killian Hayes because you're just not a good enough scorer. Like sometimes maybe Luka Doncic will miss a pass or, you know, it happens. Like if we're being honest, guys miss 
opportunities to kick the ball out all of the time. The issue though is Killian Hayes isn't as good as those guys. So you can't just screw things up and be bad. And unfortunately Killian Hayes does that all the time. Here's just another little example. Like Killian Hayes, smart player, nice back cut from the corner here, just really well executed, nice pass from Isaiah Stewart. I, Killian Hayes just isn't good enough to finish this. And to me, that's like just a, a good example of why I've never been a huge believer in Killian Hayes' game. So let's talk here now about some of the positives. And really the one positive I wanna focus on is the fact that I do believe the Pistons have a true all-star caliber player. Cade Cunningham to me is somebody who flat out is a baller. I think this guy is capable of being in multiple all-star games. My evaluation on him coming out of Oklahoma State and even beforehand when he was in high school at Montverde Academy, because my scouting starts many years in advance to college, this guy was the consensus number one pick for me. I just never moved off of that. I feel very justified in that because he's just flat out a good player. He's got one of the best mid-range jump shots in the NBA, shooting about 48% from the mid-range area, which isn't elite offense, but it's better than a lot of other guys currently in the league. And I think he's growing as a three-point shooter. I think that was a big area kind of coming into the league of, hey, what's that three-point shot going to look like? How is it going to develop? He's gotten better in that area. Um, and I think he's also gotten a little bit more athletic, a little bit more springy from his time as a cowboy. And I think just with the way that he plays in general, I've been very impressed. This is my favorite play right here. A really nice split against Nyeka Kongwu. Gets to the rim, dunks on Trey Young, plus the foul. He's just, I think, in my opinion, a really good player. And I think with the Pistons, like people lose this all the time. They lose kind of the overall context of a team and the way that the team plays and the way that the players play because of who's on your team. Think about, have you ever been at a gym? Just a basketball gym, you're playing pickup basketball with a bunch of random guys, and there's like one or two dudes on your team that don't really know what they're doing, or they're not good enough, and you're facing a team of five really good players, and you have one or two dudes on your team that just aren't to the caliber of the other team. How much does that impact your ability to find success? And if we're being honest, it's drastic. In my experiences playing any level of basketball, if you have someone on your team that the other team does not respect, they don't care about, they will leave him wide open for three, they don't really care if he cuts, whatever he does, if, if they just don't respect him, you're facing extra help defense, you're facing extra gap defenders, and you're, you're just kind of put in a spot where you have to do more to make up for the lack of talent around you. And I think the issue really specifically with Kate is not only is he facing that issue, but I think his coach is not helping them win games. I, I just, I don't think Monty Williams is doing a good job. Obviously, there's been a lot of noise about Steven Silas being on the staff as well, which surprised me that he got another job, to be honest with you. Um, obviously, you know, former head coach, you think, of course, he's going to get another assistant job somewhere. With how bad Houston went, I thought maybe he wouldn't, uh, but he did. And I think with Monty Williams specifically, like, I'm not just sitting here and screaming and saying, oh my gosh, this is a terrible coach. Like, I'm showing you actual footage of things that just doesn't work. And I have like his historic examples when they face the Mavericks. I have examples of this season when the Pistons are getting killed by Kelly Olynyk because they just have their guards switched onto him and they're asking them to guard one-on-one -on -one in the paint. Like, it's pretty crazy stuff. Like, if I, at some point, if I'm coaching an NBA team ever or even like a high college program, and someone showed me film and my team looked like that, I would be pretty heartbroken, to be completely honest with you, because I just know the way that I coach from my past coaching experiences, there's no way. There, there's no way anything would ever look like that because it is just honestly mind-bogglingly bad. Um, and the issue is you don't have Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson and Chris Paul and Devin Booker this time to bail you out you have a bunch of young guys and most of them are not equipped to be great defenders. Boyan Bogdanovich is not a great defender and the team overall just doesn't hide any of Monty Williams coaching flaws and they paid him a ton of money. I just don't really know if there's a way out of this other than firing him. Um, and I hate to say that I typically don't say things like that in my videos. Um, but I, I do mean it. Uh, it's just people are asking me how I would fix the Pistons. This is how. I would completely change what Monty Williams is doing in terms of lineup management, rotations, the way that he's coaching his overall team defense, construct, help defense. Like literally help defense is the most important thing when you're building team defense. It's like literally every coach knows, okay, my, my point of attack defender is not going to keep everyone in front of him all the time. So how do we rotate? How do we bring help? How do we stop the ball when it does get past that first line of de defense? 
and Monty Williams is just like, no, we'll just trust him out there. So the, it's just, it's mind boggling to me. I just, like, I saw it happen in Phoenix. I, to be honest, I was very low when Monty Williams went to Phoenix. I thought that was a terrible hire then. Um, and they ended up being really good. And part of that was because Mikhail Bridges took a step forward. Devin Booker took an immense step forward. They got Chris Paul. I mean, they had a lot of talent. They really did. And that's why the team made a deep run. And everything kind of clicked at the right time. Right now, nothing's clicking in Detroit. It's because he's running an antiquated scheme. And I just overall think that it's they're doomed for more losses. Like, now that I'm recording this, they'll probably find a way to luck into a win. And I'll look stupid. But I just, I just don't see any way that Detroit really overcomes this other than maybe miraculous performances from Kate Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, and some of the other players on the roster just having to step up big time and, and do a lot of nice things because when it really comes down to it, I'm just not a believer. Hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content as well. Thanks again so much for watching. It was a lot of fun to break down the Detroit Pistons with a film study and we'll catch you guys in the very next utility sports video.